down, the year started with the very first <laughs> attempt to see whether the G20 leaders uh, call to conclude the round could succeed. So that took, took from January to about April, and I think by April it was quite clear that uh, there could not be a conclusion. There was an April set of documents from the Secretariat. It was more in the form of stock taking. And then for the rest of the year, it was a struggle as to what to do at the ministerial. It was an identity crisis. It started with early harvest for LDCs, and then LDC plus, and then no LDC, but only plus. And then new issues creeping in to launch a new round when this old one could not complete. So uh, very skillfully steering through all these icebergs, we had uh, Ambassador Aga, who is with us. He chaired the general council. And finally, we had an outcome of two parts. This was also very uh, unprecedented. A chairman summary, the first part of which is uh, some kind of consensus. yeah but not legally binding. I think at the end there was something like that. And then the chairman giving a summary of what he felt was the sense of the discussion uh, during the MC8 that the ministers had given and so on. So that is the kind of platform for the, for the work uh, of this year. This work includes Doha issues, non-Doha issues, but linked to MC8, regular body issues, and also a rethink of the multilateral system. The second part of this session will have some experts uh, who will speak. They include uh, myself, Chakravati Raghavan, who, as you know, has been following the WTO since it was since before the WTO. I'm not sure whether he has arrived. <coughs> and uh, Kalas Korea, who will give us an overview of the negotiations on intellectual property. I've also asked my colleague uh, Eileen Kwa will give us a briefing on the FTAs, particularly the EPAs uh, negotiations, because trade negotiations are, of course, not only in WTO. It's also in the FTAs increasingly, and there are some new developments there, especially in relation to the European Union, their GSP policy, and the economic partnership agreements. So to kick off, uh, I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Dasgupta from India who will give us a presentation, and uh, he even has a PowerPoint presentation. Jayam Dasgupta, please. Mm. Thank you. <coughs> His Excellency, uh, uh, Mr. Makapa, Martin, and friends. Um, I will uh, have seven slides to to show you and discuss a few things about what happened uh, in the Doha round, starting from 2001, very briefly, then move on to the causes of the divergence, which has uh, been there, to my mind, right from the beginning, on major issues. Then I will talk about the, the, the impact of, or the implications of the MC8 ministerial uh, meeting, and then how do we look at the future? And I will confine my, my focus to the next two years only, till the next ministerial. And uh, I would, of course, like to have uh, your views, your participation, and any questions which you ask during my presentation would be most welcome. As we know, the Doha round itself uh, when it started in 2001, it was started in the face of, if I may say, strong opposition from many developing countries. The reason for this was manifold, but two of the most important reasons were that the implementation issues, which were brought together for the first time in the Seattle meeting in 1998, was it 98 or 99? 99. 100 issues which were put together by the developing countries related to the implementation of the Uruguay Round <coughs> Agreement, which had not been implemented properly, where there were many gaps which needed to be filled. And this continued. And in 2001, when talk started uh, <coughs> after 
to launch a new round, attention was drawn repeatedly to the implementation issues. Though they figure in the Doha round declaration, they have somewhere uh, along the way been lost. And that is a major concern of developing countries because even the Uruguay round commitments, the promises have not been fulfilled. There were breakdowns in Cancun in 2003, which is very well documented and well known. There was a breakdown in 2006 in, the, in Geneva on account of which we had to suspend the negotiations for some time. And then they started on a low key with an initiative taken by the US and the EU and Brazil and India to have a group of four countries to discuss the major points of divergence. This process also ran from about March to June 2007, and then it collapsed. And then, because there were sharp divergences, and then in July 2008, we had the mini ministerial to which about 20 odd countries were invited, and that also ended in failure. Finally, in 2011, the DG took the initiative to kickstart, and of course, with the help of the members who wanted to give it another try. And in January last year, we had another big thrust given to the negotiations of the Doha round, and it ended by about April. We realized that we couldn't make much progress because the wide divergences remain on the table. Next, please. The causes of divergence, if I may put it uh, in these words, the first is the changing world economic order. Uh, this may uh, sound very harsh, but uh, it's also well documented that till the Uruguay round, decisions in the GATT days used to be taken by a quad because it was basically about exchanging tariff uh, cuts mutually. The US, EU, Canada, Japan, these were the main players. And the developing countries did not have to pay much. So they were also not, uh, they did not have much of a voice in the matters that were discussed in different rounds of the GATT. All this changed with the coming of the Uruguay round because it encompassed many new areas, including trips, including services, including agriculture, and the developing countries had to make major contributions. By accepting trips itself, they have made a huge contribution, and that is something which we are still studying the implications of even now. And of course, there are views on that, but developing countries feel that this agreement was perhaps if they had known all its implications and consequences, they would perhaps not have entered into it in the same form that it has assumed in the Uruguay round. The second uh, <clears throat> point about the changing world economic order is that the developing countries have now, many of them, individually and of course collectively, they have now gained in terms of trade, both exports and imports. Their economies have been growing at a fast clip. Of course, I need not mention China. India also has shown for the past five, six years, of course, not after the downturn, but growths of close to 9%. Now the, pro, the, the rate has slowed down, and there was a very useful discussion yesterday in this forum. Uh, and uh, of course, most of you were here, so I need not recount that. The point that the industrialized countries would like to make, and this has been told to us privately uh, when we have had a very frank discussion one-to-one, -one, that this may be the la last integrated round of the WTO for the next 25, 30 years. We do not know whether there would be something of this kind in future. It may be a very sectoral kind of an initiative or agreement that may be attempted in future. So whatever we have to get, we have to get in this round from the developing countries, especially the emerging ones. That is the kind of perspective which many industrialized countries have. One of the countries mentioned very frankly 
that you still have water between your bound and applied rates. In NAMA, in agriculture, India has some degree of water, which is necessary for maintaining our policy space and for giving us elbow room. But the quantum of that may be debated. We have approached it with an open mind. We are willing to, we have shown our willingness to cut it down very significantly in this round, both in agriculture and in NAMA. But what they are saying from their perspective is that you have to come down to our levels in this round. Now the developed countries, for instance the US and the EU, have their industrial tariffs at around 4% or less. Now if <coughs> the, the industrialized, the, the um, NAMA tariffs for India are on an average at 34%, arithmetical average. Now if we accept the NAMA coefficient of 20 or 22 which has been uh, proposed, we come down to about 12. But from there to come down to four at one go, that is from 34 to four, especially in, uh, in, in the, the backdrop of the large scale unemployment that India has, the fact that 10 million young men and women are joining the workforce, half the size of the entire Australian population almost, and that they cannot be absorbed in agriculture, that they have to come into the manufacturing industry or the services sector to have gainful employment and to fulfill their aspirations of having uh, uh, a satisfactory life. We, where do we provide those jobs from? If we cut down our tariffs, and in this context I was reminded of a book which I read some time ago by Ha Jun Chang, who teaches at uh, Cambridge, I think, or used to. He's quoted a, a very well-known uh, economic historian of uh, the 19th century, Frederick List, who spoke about kicking the ladder. Once you have reached a certain plane of development, you kick the ladder and don't allow others to come up to that level. That is the, the point which has been brought out very clearly in that book. So this is one of the, the main reasons of divergence, this aspiration on the part of the developing countries to develop to improve their standards of living, whatever is there in the preamble to the Marrakesh Agreement. But on the other side, though it may not be articulated very explicitly, the intention or the outcome would be that this opportunity would be denied in large measure many of the developing countries. The third point of divergence, of course, builds up on this, and that is that agricultural subsidies cannot be touched because they are very sensitive politically in the developed countries. Though only 2% of uh, the population in the US and about 6-7% in the EU to our knowledge are based, are dependent for their livelihoods on agriculture. In cotton, there are about 10 million farmers and their families in Africa or dependent on cotton. In the case of India, eight million families are dependent on cotton. It has been brought out in our agricultural statistics. And I'm sure China also has a very large number of farmers dependent on cotton. And uh, the figures that were quoted to me some time ago, there are 24,800 registered farmers of cotton in the US who get billions of dollars of, of subsidies. Now this is, of course, this is not one of the major causes of divergence, but this is an example, a case in point. This shows that the divergences are very wide, and that is the reason why, despite the very uh, uh, sincere commitments made in Hong Kong about cotton, about something which should be done expeditiously, nothing has been possible to be done till 2012. And nothing is likely to happen in this regard till 2013, uh, to my mind. The other point is about tariffs. Since the tariffs already are very low, that reduction of tariffs from, let's say, by 50% by developed countries would only lead to reduction from 4 to 2% average, which will not give much market access. The problem is about the tariff peaks. There are tariffs of about 58% uh, 
in, in leather goods, about 32% in, in textiles in the US. And uh, in the EU also, there are tariff peaks in some areas, though not quite as high as in the US. Now, it would be very interesting to note that till a few years ago, the average import tariff charged of EU exports to the US were about 5% or less than 5%. Whereas the tariff for the items exported by Bangladesh to the US were attracting 16% tariffs. Therein lies the problem about tariff peaks. And therein lies the problem about how to convert this mandate of the Doha Development Round into uh, an operational, effective development round. Next, please. The other factors which have led to the continuing divergence is that there is no interest on the part of big business. Because at this moment, the, the big business in the developed countries want to tackle the behind the border issues, leading, uh, um, um, relating to investment, relating to competition, relating to government procurement, um, relating to, of course, investment in services. Okay, thanks. Another, another 10 minutes? Yeah. Oh, right, thanks. Um, that has led to this um, terming of some new issues and investment and competition figure prominently amongst them. Now, we had taken a decision that on the, on the 1st of August 2004 that these competition issues will not be brought into the WTO fold till the Doha round were to conclude. Now, this is again sought to be brought in. So the implication is either that the Doha round has effectively concluded for some people, some countries, that they do not want to conclude it. That is why they are bringing in these issues again or that things have changed in such a fashion that the investment and competition issues which were there in 2004 are no longer in the same form, which is not the case. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was, and this is the last on this issue, the gains from the DDA have been grossly exaggerated by people who have been votaries of this round. And uh, I was uh, recently, I came across a, statement by Bernard Huckman of the World Bank. And he has said that we, the World Bank, are also to blame for this because we grossly exaggerated the gains from this round. Now, when we started reading about the gains, they ranged from $60 billion additional uh, um, uh, trade to now about $300 billion. There are some extremely optimistic people who calculate it at $700 billion. Be that as it may, the size of global trade today is approximately $18 trillion. Even if it is $300 billion, it is minuscule. The other point which is sought to be made is that half of this gain will perhaps come from trade facilitation alone. So reduction of tariffs, changing in the rules, will pave the path for gains in future, but not immediate gains in terms of um, um, uh, additional trade. The unreasonable expectations, and especially in the, with reference to one country amongst the business, they expect a huge windfall for emerging countries to happen as a consequence of the conclusion of this round if it were possible to do it ever. And that is why they, can, they pitch their demands at exorbitantly high levels, exceedingly unrealistic levels. And that makes it even more difficult because they have enough political clout, they can uh, shape the policies, the trade policies of their government, and that makes it even more difficult. Next, please. Uh, is, is, it the, is it a fact that this uh, round could not be concluded because of the uh, economic downturn which overtook all of us in September 2008? I, I do not, frankly speaking, think so. It uh, was not the cause, but it makes it, the economic downturn makes it even more difficult to come to an agreement because most countries, or almost all countries, are not in a position to make very significant sacrifices or offers 
to the others because the, of their domestic political constituency and their economic problems. Can the emerging countries act as the engines of growth? And I think this question was answered uh, very eloquently yesterday. The emerging countries can contribute, but they can't substitute. They can complement, but they can't substitute, to quote <laughs> Professor Deepak Nair here, uh, the, the impetus that was being provided by the industrialized countries earlier to <coughs> 2008. Next, please. What are the implications of the eighth ministerial conference of the WTO? It reiterated the primacy of LDC issues and development. Early harvest was already there in the original Doha Declaration in terms of para 47, but it talks of implementation, not of uh, uh, harvesting and then implementing to the detriment of the single undertaking and not concluding the single undertaking at all. It could only be a piece of a piece with the whole agreement. And that is what people are trying to overlook or tending to, to ignore. It also allowed for exploration of alternative approaches, which, of course, is a contentious issue, because alternative approaches have been taken, as I will uh, discuss uh, in the next slide, has been taken to mean different things to different people. One very important thing which uh, came out of MC8 was nobody was prepared to give up on Doha and on the single undertaking. But whether this is a genuine and sincere commitment or only paying lip service because nobody wants to act as uh, the villain of the peace remains to be seen. And I think the truth lies between sincerity and the other extreme of not being the first to uh, call the animal dead. Next, please. The new initiatives approaches which have uh, uh, which we have come to hear about, of course, uh, from second-hand sources, not from the, the proponents themselves, is a plurilateral in services. Uh, this is being sought to be uh, entered into, not in terms of uh, the Annex 4 uh, of the Marrakesh Agreement, which had uh, initially four agreements, the Government Procurement Agreement, the Agreement on Civil Aircraft, and uh, Dairy and... Uh, area and I think bovine products. Um, but this would need a ministerial decision with an explicit consensus. That is, in the present circumstances, unlikely to happen. So the preferred approach seems to be to have an Article 5 GATS FTA amongst the willing parties. And we have heard that there are about 16 countries which are uh, engaged in discussions, preliminary discussions at this stage, and that they are very keen to have this kind of an FTA, which, according to one uh, very um, uh, significant industry association of an important industrialized country, will push the recalcitrant emerging countries to join in the FTA. Now, of those 16 countries, I do not, need not name them, <coughs> There are already FTAs existing between about 10 of them. So it is only the smaller six countries which will probably have to join in because of, I don't know, economic compulsions or uh, political compulsions or a mix of both. But this is the initiative which, is, uh, uh, which has been taken. But it has very far-reaching con consequences for the Doha Round and for multilateralism. Because <laughs> the Doha Round and the WTO stands for multilateralism. There is a fine balance which has been sought to be maintained between market access in agriculture, in NAMA, and in services. And if services is plucked out of this as an early harvest through a plurilateral, there will be very little incentive for people to open up their agriculture sectors or to reduce their subsidies or to change the status quo in agriculture, or in NAMA for that matter. And that <coughs> will damage the whole structure in such a manner that it will probably be next to impossible to conclude the Doha round. <coughs> Other issues which are sought to be uh, harvested early are trade facilitation, in which <coughs> there has been a, a case has been made out that it is something which is self-balancing. My friend, uh, the Honorable uh, Ambassador of Tanzania will speak on this issue, I'm sure. 
because uh, a long time ago, I had a very interesting discussion with uh, my developing country friends and colleagues. And they said that trade facilitation, from the point of view of some of others, some of us, is basically import facilitation for exporters. And this needs to be redressed through technical and financial assistance. Nobody gave, nobody <coughs> disputes the, the benefits for global trade uh, through trade facilitation. But it has to be balanced, it has to be equitable, and you can't have a binding commitment taken by the poorest of countries unless you provide them with financial and technical assistance. That is where there is a big lacuna because nobody from the developed countryside According to the mandate, they have to make a commitment, firm commitment, uh, is prepared to make a commitment at this stage. <clears throat> Other DDA, non-DDA issues like food security, energy, are likely to come up. Anti-protectionism is something which is like uh, the seven, seven blind men of Hindustan and the elephant. Somebody is uh, touching the trunk, somebody is touching the, the feet, legs. Nobody really knows what it means. Some people tend to portray it only as tariffs. You can't raise your applied tariffs to your bound level. That is protectionism. But they will go around using anti-dumping and subsidies, countervailing measures to their heart's content. That will not be protectionism. What I have heard very recently articulated by some of the industrialized countries is that if you insist on local content, it is protectionism. If you put any barriers, on investments, it is protectionism, even if they have existed from before. So what is sought to be now uh, attained is removal of all these barriers, whether they come in the investments chapter, competition chapter, other chapters, through this uh, crusade against protect so-called protectionism. Next, please. Uh, this is the last slide, uh, I'm very happy to say. Um, the agenda for the future is that there is a leadership vacuum. The GATT days, everything was hunky-dory. The engine rolled forward, the wheels rolled forward, because it was only the court. And everybody had a, an interest in it. Now if there is uh, lack of interest, lack of a willingness to make sacrifices, compromises, that, that, that is a real problem. And this leadership vacuum can't be filled by the emerging countries on their own. Uh, they can't provide uh, the kind of market access, the kind of uh, 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 encouragement to the rest of the world, the kind of incentives to the rest of the world to come in and sign the agreement. So it will not be possible to conclude the Doha round without this leadership vacuum question getting settled in some way. And for this, it is necessary to build trust and confidence Multilateralism helps everyone, but it also, a rule-based multilateral system in the present context helps the poorer developing countries more because they have certainty and predictability. They have the rule of the law. Uh, of course, uh, it is another question that the rule of the law cannot be implemented for some countries, but still. So uh, the last point is that we need a spirit of compromise and give and take to for multilateralism to progress further. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Dasgupta. I'm sure you agree that was very comprehensive, which also meant he took up quite a lot of time, <laughs> because we have sorry, limited I'm sorry, time. I'm very sorry. So I hope our other ambassadors will be a little bit more brief. We also gave Jayan more time, because uh, he was the prime initiator, if I'm right of forming the Friends of Development. It started as a Friends of Development statement that was made at the MC8. You will find a copy of this statement uh, in the South Bulletin, which we have reproduced in full. I think this was a very uh, important and perhaps will prove to be a historic development because it got all the major groups of developing countries uh, <coughs> together, and I understand uh, you will be holding regular meetings. So for that, uh, we, we, we gave you the initial statement that has covered a lot of ground. Uh, and now I turn to Ambassador Yi of uh, uh, China to give us his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the South Center to organize this uh, timely workshop. The theme of this morning session is reflections on the WTO 8th Ministerial Conference and future of the multilateral trading system. So I will divide my intervention into two parts, the Doha trade talk and the multilateral trading system. We are all disappointed at the, at the current impact in the Doha round, which should have been concluded years ago. The scholars and the media are even more fed up with this and bluntly declaring that the Doha round is dead. I believe that the question marks are hovering over everyone's head. First, do we buy this argument that Doha is dead? As for China's case, definitely no. China is the strong supporter of Doha Rong since its commencement, and you can be assured that China is still fully committed <coughs> to the successful conclusion of the round. And the message from Davos could give us even more relief. As both trade ministers and business leaders are not giving up this round, they are all advocating that a successful conclusion of the round will boost the global economic growth. Second question is, what shall we do next? The current global economic image and political climate are not friendly to conclude the round this year. But waiting for the better political climate will not simply suffice. Various ideas have been floated to move the trade agenda forward. The members have not yet reached consensus. China believes that the political guidance we got at MC8 and paragraph 47 of the Doha Declaration in particular could shed some light in order to prove that this round is alive and the pragmatic progress can be made, we should focus on some issues with less political divergence and greater technical maturity, such as issues related to the needs of LDCs. In regard to other issues, China is open to any approaches and discussions, as long as they contribute to the conclusion of the round and strengthen the multilateral trading system. We fully share with what Minister Ralph Davis from South Africa said, i.e., any steps agreed need to go in the direction of eventually achieving the same aims as the Doha round that was launched 11 years ago. The third question mark comes to the relevance of the multilateral trading system. It is widely recognized that this system is at crossroads as the wrong is stalled. Bilateral and regional trade agreements are arising and the pressure to halt or reverse trade liberalization is increasing. However, we need to bear in mind that multilateral trading system brings prosperity across countries helps lift millions of people out of poverty and <clears throat> and serves as the anchor to fight against <coughs> trade protectionism. In this context, China firmly believes that it is of most significance to preserve the value of this system and make it more responsive to the needs of members, in particular the needs of developing ones. In this regard, we have plenty of work to do, such as aid for trade, initiatives, accession of new members, and of LDCs in particular. 
Mr. Chairman, before I conclude my intervention, I would like to add one more comment. Last week, <coughs> Minister Tim Grosser from New Zealand referred to a famous Chinese saying when they discussed how to move the boat around for crossing the river by touching the stone. This is a famous saying by uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping. That says, that illustrates China's attitude toward its opening up and reform process in the past decades. Here I want to make further uh, uh, collaboration on this point. We are fully aware that objectives is to cross the river. So we need to roll up the trousers, <coughs> step into the water, and move forward on, uh, by touching the stone. Meanwhile, please keep, in, uh, keep this in mind. Each stone is important for crossing the river, in particular the stone that we will touch. It may help us cross the river, <coughs> It may prevent us from crossing the river, or even get us drunk in the river. So be careful. When you choose which stone to touch, please pick those flat, solid, and the balanced ones. <laughs> so I do hope that WTO members will have the good luck and find the correct stone. Mr. Chairman, I now turn the floor back to you, and I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, <coughs> Ambassador Yi. In another lecture, you will tell us which stone is balanced and which one will <laughs> drown us. Okay. <laughs> but now we turn to uh, Ambassador Abdul Hanan from Bangladesh, who, as you know, coordinates the LDC group. And uh, we are all very eager to learn from you what the LDC group wants uh, in the year ahead. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, uh, good morning. Martin, I thank you uh, for inviting me to this panel. And uh, at the very beginning, I must say that uh, as a member of LDCs, uh, we always learn from you. Anyway. Uh, as you said, that I had the privilege of coordinating the WTO LDC group during the last one year. I would therefore try to begin uh, bringing bring in the LDC perspective into, the, uh, into this discussion. What happened during MC8 and prior to that is more or less common knowledge. It was at best a mixed bag as far as the LDCs were concerned. There had been broad-based support for an LDC-specific package from MC8, but we couldn't arrive at a consensus. The LDC group was ready to consider an LDC plus package, but an agreement on what should be included in the plus package looked like a distant prospect. <coughs> the LDCs argued that the LDC-specific priorities should not be held hostage to an outcome on the plus or additional issues and that it made no sense to counterbalance LDC priorities with other DDA issues. The discussions evolved from that stage, and in the final count, the LDCs did manage to reach agreements on some issues of importance to them, including the decision on the LDC services waiver. Although these outcomes fell far fell far short of our expectations in the given circumstances, we did acknowledge that these were some of the few substantive decisions that emerged from MC8. In a wider sense, these decisions have proved once again that the multilateral trading system remains the best bet for WTO members, especially the weakest among uh, weakest amongst them, and that with sufficient political will it is indeed possible to progressively deliver on the development mandate of Doha. This is the message that the LDCs had taken back, back home from MC8 and would continue to refer to while looking into the future. We did start 2011 on a high note. There was the highest level political impetus to conclude the Doha round by the end of the year. However, 
it soon became apparent that the possibility of doing uh, so looked remote. The negotiating function of the WTO virtually came to a standstill. All efforts were then directed at shaping the process and agenda for MC8. This opened up the rifts, but also helped identify the possible grounds of convergence. The best thing that the best thing was that all delegations continued to reaffirm their commitment to Doha. We all agreed that no one wanted Doha to fail. That is what we have heard from ministers again and again at MC8. This is what has been eloquently captured in the consensual part of the chair's statement. It therefore comes as a bit of surprise as we hear from some quarters the call for going back to the drawing board and thinking afresh. If anything, MC8 has urged uh, us to remain true to the Doha mandate and build on the achievements made in the DDA negotiations so far. In so doing, it recognized the need for taking a pragmatic approach moving step by step. On the whole, MC8 upheld the primacy of the multilateral process. LDCs in particular remain wary of any process otherwise, since any potential coalition of the willing uh, would only leave them aside in the margins. For obvious reasons, there is a sense of urgency in the LDC camp for Doha to be concluded. LDCs have staked more than their fair share in Doha for a meaningful outcome from the conclusions of the round. They are the ones that have suffered the most due to the global financial and economic crisis. They have witnessed the erosion of many of their development gains at a single stroke. In this backdrop, the international community adopted the Istanbul Program of Action for LDCs in April last year. The program aims at the end of this decade to help half of the LDCs graduate from their status and to double their share of global trade from current 1%. These are lofty goals indeed and would require serious, sustained and concerted efforts by LDCs and their development partners. The Doha deliverables for LDCs would be absolutely critical in the process. On their part, the LDCs have shown their readiness to increasingly integrate their economies into the multilateral trading system. It is now long long overdue for the system to give the LDCs the enabling tools to do so. The LDC priorities are widely known and well documented. There is no point in food dragging on an early harvest on duty-free, quota-free market access for all products from all LDCs as agreed in Hong Kong, or an ambitious, expeditious and specific outcome on cotton. We are not creating any unjust demands or expectations that would not make sufficient sense for all concerned, including our development partners. So what is it that LDCs expect as follow-up to MC8? Firstly, to keep LDCs very much involved in the ongoing reflection on how to proceed. If we do subscribe to the notion of an inclusive and bottom-up approach, there must be space for LDCs to voice their priorities and concerns. Secondly, we do recognize the pitfalls for rushing into negotiations at any time soon, but we cannot wait for an indefinite period to resume our work. Prior to MC8, LDCs and others had been asking for a post-MC8 work program. Since that, that, since that didn't come about, we must now put our minds together to make an incremental yet definitive progress in Doha. In paragraph, if paragraph 47 is the answer, so be it. LDC's priorities remain the best recipe for an early harvest. This would mark a huge leap of faith in Doha and would pave the way for reaching early agreements on other mature areas of DDA negotiations. Thirdly, while we wait the negoti negotiating groups to resume their work, we can start working on implementing the MCA decisions and other consensual understandings. We take it as a positive sign that work 
has already started on finding ways to further strengthen and operationalize the 2002 LDC accession guidelines. We must explore ways to add substance to the decision on LDC services waiver, review and implement the special and differential treatments under WTA agreements, and further strengthen the Committee on Trade and Development to fulfill its mandate. Fourthly, we must, remain, we must maintain a common front among developing countries <coughs> in support, to preserve, support of preserving the integrity of the multilateral process. Without delving into polemics, we must urge caution against pursuing a selective plurilateral approach by scuttling the multilateral process merely on the sake of expediency. And lastly, we must continue to support WTO in its role as a vanguard against protectionist tendencies in the current global economic environment. Time has, yet, time has not yet come to give the final judgment on Doha. It is too early to say that Doha has failed to deliver. Doha is not an isolated phenomenon. The stalemate in Doha is symptomatic of the malaise in the overall multilateral process at the moment. But this will pass. The multilateral spirit will prevail. We must wait and stand by to seize the right moment. Antar 13 is the round the corner. Let us use this opportunity to reaffirm our shared commitment to Doha. For LDCs, it would be well nigh impossible to think of any other viable alternative to Doha at this stage. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that eloquent statement uh, of LDC in 10. I just want to pledge the uh, support of the South Centre, particularly on two LDC issues. The first is uh, the renewal of the TRIPS waiver. And the second is uh, the terms of accession for LDCs. These are two immense topics. There was some progress in the MCA on it. It paved the way for rail decisions uh, this year. And in any way that the South Centre can help you uh, and help the LDCs in that uh, we will do all our best for that. And now let us uh, listen to our General Counsel Chairman, Ambassador Aga, who will steer us through the MC8 and hopefully will, in the next one month, where he is still um, uh, the, the Chair, to pave the way for good negotiations this year. Of course, he's speaking in his personal capacity. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Martin. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Kappa, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's very difficult to speak after some eloquent uh, presentations by the previous uh, speakers, whose views I share. Uh, if it were a judicial panel, maybe I would have simply said I concur, and I'm sure the sentence would have been passed. But uh, I may need to just uh, make some slant in the discussions, taking into account the fact that uh, uh, two of the previous speakers are part of the problem in the negotiations, <coughs> because they are part of the major players. Uh, Martin, I, I, I intend to. I, intend to discuss this issue from the preparation for MC8, the nature of the outcome, and the challenges for the future of the multilateral trading system. I think the presentation by Giant did cover a lot of the history and the nature of the challenges we have in the, at the beginning of the negotiations. Uh, Martin had alluded to the fact that the outcome of NC8 was unique. And I want to assure him that that was a deliberate effort. It was deliberate because uh, if you, those of us here who work in the WTO, I started that process in May. And I foresaw some challenges in the negotiations. And I foresaw a situation whereby if those challenges are not properly handled, they could become toxic to the whole MC8 process and its outcome. So I wanted to.